Hello and welcome to the inaugural Pink and Equine Talk to the Pony Club on First Aid and Common Ailments of the Horse Part 1. I'm Richard Bristow, I work at Pinkham Equine along with Charlie Pinkham, Nat Hind and Lucy Brock. We are a four vet equine practice based in Wilton just outside Salisbury, covering an area that extends up towards Marlborough, down to the south coast and between Wincanton and Winchester. We undertake all forms of equine work but have a particular focus on breeding and uh, poor performance and lameness investigation. In this week's talk I'm going to focus primarily on what makes a healthy horse. I'll show you how to assess uh, various different parts of your horse and by knowing how your horse appears on a normal day-to-day uh, -day basis that will make it simpler to pick up any signs of ill health or injury that may arise. I think the first question to ask yourself when you see your horse each morning, be that in the field or in the stable, is is your horse pleased to see you? So do they come to the field entrance and greet you? Do they come and greet you over the stable door? And it's knowing and learning what's normal for your horse or pony, such that if they do something out of the ordinary, you can pick up on that. So if the horse is stood at the back of the stable instead of coming to greet you, or if it's stood in the corner of the field instead of walking, trotting or cantering across to you, then that should certainly um, trigger an alarm bell and stimulate some further investigation. The next question to ask yourself is, do they have a good appetite? Uh, different horses and ponies will um, take different amounts of times to eat their food, but it's important to recognise what's normal for your horse. Um, so how quickly they eat their food, whether they eat all of it up, whether they are used to eating some and then coming back and finishing the rest later. Um, but it's just important to know what's normal for your particular animal um, such that you can pick up on any changes to that. Um, it's also worth uh, keeping an eye on them occasionally when they're eating their, their feed or their hay um, to tell whether they are eating that normally or whether um, any parts of that are dropping from the mouth, whether they've got any difficulty eating, um, as that can alert you to, um, to dental problems. The next question, does your horse have bright eyes and a clean nose? Um, eyes, as you can see in this picture, um, should normally be, um, you know, the horse should be bright and alert, um, open, not closed, uh, no sort of swellings around them and um, nostrils should normally be clean. There may be um, a small stream of trickle of, of clear mucus, that can be normal, uh, particularly if horses had their head down um, grazing or eating from the floor. Um, but anything that's more than trickle or anything that is white or yellow or green in appearance um, should certainly, um, again, trigger an alarm bell and um, prompt some further investigation. Is your horse in good condition? Um, so I put this particular slide up of a sort of a, um, a rather thin horse um, just to try and illustrate the point that um, a lot of the um, appearance of UC in the horse's um, abdomen in particular uh, is influenced by how much food they've, they've, recently in, they've recently eaten. So in particular I'm trying to refer to uh, the concept of gut fill which is um, where the intestines, if they're eating um, a lot of uh, forage, so grass or hay or haylage, um, the intestines will be bulked out by the passage of that food um, as it passes through them. And that gives their abdomen that sort of rounded appearance. Um, horses that are um, receiving a higher proportion of their food from concentrates, so um, in particular terms, that would be sort of racehorses, will have um, perhaps less hay passing through them and that will give them a slightly more tucked up or greyhound-like appearance, um, something akin to this to this horse. Um, but again, it's being familiar with your horse's normal appearance um, such that you can be alert to any change from that. Is their coat healthy? This may seem like a uh, simple question to ask yourself, but it's one that's worth doing so. Um, a horse that is well fed with a balanced diet and well groomed should typically have a healthy shiny coat. Um, so coats that are uh, dull or starey or have sort of patches of, of raised hair um, may be indicative of um, an underlying problem. 
So the vital signs of the horse and how to take them. Uh, the three that we will be looking at will be the heart rate, the respiratory rate and the temperature. So a horse's heart rate should typically be between 28 and 44 beats per minute. The respiratory rate should be between 10 and 24 breaths per minute. And the temperature should be between 37 and 38 and a half degrees centigrade. There are two places where it's relatively straightforward to take a pulse in a horse or pony. The first is in the lower limb uh, level with the fetlock joint. If you hold your finger and thumb uh, slightly apart and move them backwards and forwards um, as they rest on the horse's leg, uh, then you should be able to feel the vein, artery and nerve bundle uh, as it passes past the fetlock joint down towards the lower limb. Uh, the blood vessels will feel uh, will be about the size of a drinking straw and once you've located them you want to leave your finger and thumb resting gently upon them and then you should be able to feel a pulse uh, particularly in your fingertips. It's useful a to be able to do that so you can, so you can take a pulse but b if you have uh, signs of inflammation if you have um, fatabsis or bruising or laminitis or sort of various other conditions in the lower limb that cause inflammation there then that pulse will get stronger so it's worth having a feel and knowing what's normal for your horse uh, the other place you can take a pulse is on the face if you feel um, run your fingers uh, along the lower aspect of the jaw just in front of where the um, the corner and where the back of a head collar would sit then you should be able to feel again a drinking straw size sort of blood vessel um, passing over the ridge of bone and then by resting your fingertips gently upon it you should be able to um, feel the pulse. Taking your horse's respiratory rate is relatively straightforward particularly on a cool day where you can see the breath at their nostrils um, but if you can't see the breath at their nostrils then um, just take a look at their abdomen and uh, count the breaths as they um, as they breathe in and out. There's only one way to take the temperature in a horse and that's by putting a thermometer into their bottom. Uh, so take the tail and move it slightly to one side and then uh, insert the thermometer. If you're using a digital thermometer then you should hear a beep when it has um, it's read the temperature that will take about 30 seconds if you're using a glass thermometer then I, you need to leave it in there for up to three minutes make sure you keep hold of it um, because it's not the best job in the world to go in there and get it back out again afterwards it's also useful to be able to assess your horse's mucous membranes and something called the capillary refill time uh, to do this, you want to lift up your horse's lip and push uh, finger or thumb onto the gum. Um, the gums should be uh, pale pink in colour, they should be um, relatively moist. And when you push your finger and thumb onto the gum, it should go white and then the pink colour should uh, return within two or three seconds. Um, it takes a little bit of practice, uh, particularly if your horse or pony isn't terribly cooperative, as um, Diamond here got fed up after about the sixth go of, uh, of trying to practice on him. Another thing that's useful to be able to do is to be able to listen to your horse's gut sounds or borborygmy. So you can do this by placing your ear um, on the side of your horse or pony's tummy um, and listening for between 30 seconds and a minute. There's no set sort of rate or rhythm for what's normal, um, except to say that over the course of sort of 30 seconds or a minute, you should probably hear more sounds than um, periods of silence. Um, but again, it's worth just doing this to your horse from time to time so you, you can get an idea of what's normal for your particular horse. So having looked at whether your horse is happy and healthy, now let's look at what we have to do to keep them happy and healthy. One of the most important things we can do is to vaccinate them. Your horse or pony will most commonly be vaccinated against influenza and against tetanus. Um, influenza is a virus, um, it's related to the flu virus that we get. Um, tetanus is a bacterial infection that lives, uh, bacteria live in the soil and it can enter through any kind of wound, um, be that in the foot or in the lower limb that might get mud in it or occasionally through um, injuries within the mouth. So it's something that they can be exposed to um, very easily 
and uh, thus it's important to um, to protect them against that. Um, we increasingly commonly now also vaccinate horses against equine herpes virus one and four. Um, it's always been common to do this in breeding stock, but um, particularly after the recently publicised outbreaks in, of uh, EHV at Crofton Manor, um, this is becoming more frequently um, uh, used in sort of competition horses and ponies. Um, and the final commonly used vaccination is rotavirus, which is uh, more widely used um, in breeding stock. It's worth knowing the vaccination schedule under which your horse is going to compete. The Pony Club follows the rules laid down by the British Horse Racing Authority or the BHA, and that's predominantly because the, a lot of Pony Club rallies are held on racecourse premises. Um, so the first vaccination is given. You then have a window of between 21 and 92 days for the second vaccination to be given. Uh, and then about seven days after the second vaccination has been given, your horse is considered to be protected and can go out and compete. And then a third vaccination needs to be given um, between 150 and 215 days after the date of the second vaccination. Uh, there is an app that you can download from the App Store, um, which is called the Equi BioSafe app, and that's got a little um, uh, area within the app which you can insert the dates of your horse's vaccinations and it will tell you when the next one is due um, and there are obviously various um, date and time calculators that you can use to achieve the same thing. Um, and I think in this day and age with iPhones etc it's very sensible to try and uh, put a reminder in your diary that gives you an alert a week or two before your vaccination is due. Um, don't just leave it to your mum and dad to remember um, because it is, you know, frustrating uh, when you get to, you know, the day before the rally and suddenly realise that your horse should have been vaccinated a month ago and thus you can't attend. Um, and particularly in the light of the influenza outbreak of last year, um, pony clubs are a lot stricter on this topic. So um, definitely worth getting a passport out, looking to see when the vaccination is due, making a reminder in your calendar and then um, making sure that you're on top of that and then you will avoid uh, the need for a restart or any kind of disappointment or frustration when you can't attend um, a competition or rally or camp etc that you want to. It's worth knowing what the rules are around um, your horse and their passport. Uh, all horses have to have a passport and that passport needs to be with them the majority of the time, particularly when the horse is being moved um, in and out of the country or within the country um, to competition, um, to a new premises, um, if the horse is presented uh, at a slaughterhouse, um, the passport needs to be present when the horse is sold or when the horse is used for breeding purposes. And when a veterinary surgeon attends the horse to give vaccinations or any other medication, the passport should be present um, either to record the vaccination or to record certain um, specific medications. Um, as I said, the horse is required to have the passport with it when it is being transported. The only exception to that is when um, the horse is being transported for emergency and veterinary treatment, and there may not be time to locate it, etc. Um, if a horse or pony was given a passport uh, now, then that horse or pony would need to have a microchip inserted in it in order to get the passport. Um, it's possible in certain older horses or ponies that they may have um, they may have a passport without um, having a microchip um, but all horses ponies and donkeys will need to have a microchip inserted in them by 1st of October 2020. It's also important to um, keep an eye on the condition of your horse's teeth. Um, horses teeth erupt at a rate of four to five millimeters per year and uh, whilst they are typically worn down by um, the process of eating, sharp points can develop along the outside of the upper teeth next to the cheek and along the inside of the lower teeth next to the tongue. Uh, so 
if left um, unchecked, then these points can get very sharp and they can push into the sides of the horse's cheeks and cause ulceration and discomfort. And that will affect um, your horse's ability to eat and also uh, his ability to perform when ridden. So signs of dental pain um, can include dropping food when they're eating, particularly um, hay, uh, balling that food up and dropping it out of their mouth. Um, they also may also shake their head when they're ridden. Um, and you may, if sort of if it's gone on for a while, it may cause weight loss or inappetence. So in order to keep on top of this, um, you should have your horse's teeth checked every six months. Um, and that should be done either by your vet or by a an equine dental technician um, who should be a member of the British Association of Equine Dental Technicians or the BAEDT. And that process involves popping a gag or a speculum onto your horse's head, um, which holds the jaw open, and then it enables someone to look into the mouth with a torch and a mirror, um, examine the teeth, and also to have a feel along them with a hand um, to make sure uh, there are no sharp edges or to attend to them if there are. The last area of uh, routine horse care that I want to touch on is worming. And the question is, why do we worm horses? And hopefully this photo will give you um, uh, an answer to that. There are um, four common types of worms that we are interested in in horses. They are the small red worms or cyathostomes, the large red worms or strongyles, large round worms, which are also known as parascarids, and tapeworms. All of these different worms have slightly different um, life cycles within the horse and on the pasture, but the basic premise of it is shown here. Uh, so a horse consumes larvae as it grazes. That larvae is ingested and migrates um, through various different sites within the horse and develops into an adult. Once the um, adult is in situ in the intestine, it will lay eggs and these eggs are passed out through the manure and um, they then, when they're on the pasture, they will hatch and develop into larvae which um, become present on the pasture and are then eaten and so on and so forth. So it's important to um, address the management of worms uh, at a number of different stages in this, uh, in this cycle. The first is by pasture management. So that involves removing the droppings from the pasture before the eggs can hatch and develop into larvae. And that's done by poo picking. Um, and the second uh, approach is by treating the adult worms as they are in the horse. And that is by um, worming your horse with various different drugs. So the traditional approach uh, to worming would have been um, to have a worming program and that would have involved the administration of different drugs to your horse at various different times during the year. Um, and those would have been designed to eliminate uh, the worms from your horse and prevent any problems arising. However, uh, in light of the fact that um, A, uh, overuse of wormers leads to resistance um, and B, the distribution of worms within different numbers of horses, uh, there's a slightly more um, enlightened approach that's now possible to take. So we know from our investigation of um, the numbers of worms within horses that uh, approximately 80% of the worms are resident within 20% of the horses. This means that if you have a herd of 10 horses, um, then it's likely that only uh, a couple of horses in that herd will have a high enough worm burden that needs or requires treatment. And the other horses in that herd um, will probably be quite happily coexisting with a low number of worms within them um, that aren't, will not be causing any pathology and thus don't need um, to receive any treatment. So the reason that we don't um, just blanket treat all horses and ponies with wormer is that um, when we worm a particular horse, whilst we may kill the majority of the worms within the horse, um, a small percentage of them will survive. And then 
as those uh, worms that survived continue to lay eggs, it's more likely that their offspring um, will develop resistance to the uh, to the treatments used on that particular horse, particularly if you continue to use the same type of drug repeatedly. What you can um, what you can cause to happen is the development of a population of worms um, where the majority of the worms in that population are resistant to the uh, to the wormer that you have previously been using, um, and that would mean that uh, treatment of the horse with that wormer would have no effect. Um, so, in order to maximise um, the uh, potential use of the wormer and minimise the development of resistance, what we want to do is only use the drugs um, where absolutely necessary. And we can do this by um, no longer continuing to blanket treat all horses and ponies, um, you know, at 13 week intervals throughout the year, but by using um, a technique called a worm egg count. Uh, to identify which horses or ponies have a high worm burden and thus need treating. So you, you can do this by collecting a small amount of poo from your horse, sending it off to uh, a laboratory, and the lab will analyse the poo, count the number of eggs within the um, droppings, and then will send a report back to you that tells you whether your horse uh, requires treatment or not. That concludes our talk on uh, the healthy aspects of the horse and um, what we need to do to uh, maintain their health. Next week we will look at um, some of the problems that can arise that can make them unhappy or unhealthy. Um, I'll also uh, talk you through how to recognise a forelimb and a hindlimb lameness and we'll look at various different emergencies and um, talk about what to do um, should they arise. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining me. Um, there are on the Pink Mequine website a number of different webinars um, which cover some of the topics um, that we've talked about this morning in more detail. Um, there's a good one in particular on um, worming and uh, how to correctly manage your um, the worming process in your horse um, by Charlie. So I would encourage you to go and look at that and um, yeah, that goes over it in, in sort of more detail than I've been able to today. Uh, thank you and see you again next week.